Well, welcome. This is uh, our broadcast um, about, uh, we're looking at multi-site. We've got a whole run of these over the next year, looking at different issues around multi-site. And, and we're pleased to have you with us. If you're watching live or if you're um, watching it uh, re-recorded or if you're watching us live on Facebook, uh, it's good to have you here. We have got with us today um, Brad House uh, from uh, Sojourn Church uh, across the pond in the States, um, which we're very excited to have him with us. Um, he's uh, recently written a book called Multi Church, um, which has actually been doing the rounds a bit with uh, friends of ours who are, are getting into multi site or in multi site. Uh, one of the more recent um, and probably the most kind of in depth and detailed um, multi site um, book and explanation of that. Uh, we've seen so we thought it'd be great to have a conversation uh, with Brad and we also have with us uh, Colin Barron who's based here in Manchester in the UK uh, who himself has um, planted and led and uh, a couple of multi-site churches as well as been involved in coaching numbers of multi-site leaders um, and uh, we'll start off with some introductions and then um, we'll get into kind of the, the meat of what we do and then we'll do some Q&A so um, Brad tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your church? Uh, yeah, so um, uh, like I said, I'm, I'm in Louisville, Kentucky uh, at Sojourn Church. I have uh, four kids from 14 to 7. Uh, so wherever we go, we bring a party. And uh, our church in Louisville is a multi church, what we would call multi church, uh, five uh, congregations within the city or within the uh, uh, Louisville metro area. Uh, so one is in southern Indiana, but that's right across the river. Uh, and so we have, uh, yeah, five church and what we call a collective model of uh, multi-church. Uh, very interesting. And we'll get into that in a, in a bit, the, uh, the whole multi-church idea. Uh, Colin, uh, tell us a bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm in uh, South Winchester. Lived here 25 years. Got three kids, seven grandkids. And uh, this is the second multi-site that we've planted. And uh, 25 years ago, we started and uh, uh, did eight sites, uh, and uh, then they all went separate so we did to their uh, church uh, orbits. And uh, six are going, but two are not, and one of those is replanted. Uh, and then we started again after having gone to the States for a couple of years, and uh, we're now. Uh, I think our seventh uh, meeting now we just started. Very good, very good. Okay, um, well, my plan for this conversation uh, is pretty simple, really. Uh, Brad, in his book, there you go, uh, he uh, very helpfully um, gave us uh, the, the kind of spectrum of models of churches that he kind of uh, dug into. Um, and uh, it's worth buying just for that. It's just really very helpful. Uh, numbers of um, kind of leaders around our, our network of churches, frontiers that we've spoken to, read that book, found um, that that kind of spectrum really helpful. Uh, we've realized actually in lots of conversations about multi-site um, that numbers of churches go into it without quite realizing where they even want to get to and what they want to look like when they get there. Um, and so sometimes stumble into different models by accident or by compromise or by evolution, uh, perhaps without clear thought. Um, and so uh, what I would like to do today between the two of you, Brad and Colin, is to really work our way through these different models, through the seven different models, uh, kind of going through the pros and cons and then have you guys commenting, uh, particularly in your journeys in multi-site from, uh, so the first, um, first one on the spectrum is the pillar church which is one church in one meeting uh, one place and I, that, that is where every church starts isn't it? so your journey from that as the pillar church to wherever you have ended up now and i think brad you probably ended up in a different place um maybe only by degrees but with us here in manchester so i, I personally i think it'd be really interesting very helpful so just we'll start off very briefly with the pillar church um as simply as one church with a single service. Uh, and when the multi-site thing kicked off, there were a lot of people who would kind of hold dear to the pillar church. So what do you guys see as the pros, the big pros and the cons of this, of that kind of very traditional pillar church? 
Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, one of the things that, that's really important is, as we looked at the spectrum, was that, you know, we, there are areas or there are churches or models that may be different, but they're not necessarily unbiblical models, right? Um, and so when you look at the pillar church, pillar churches, there's million, millions of pillar churches around, around the world uh, in terms of just a single site, single meeting um, uh, church. And, and so that's certainly a viable model uh, for, uh, for any, uh, any congregation. Um, so th for me, that's kind of the, the like, that's the, that's the steady state, right? Like, um, that's the control model. Um, where a church, if it's not, if it's, if it's not hitting up against any driver to move it beyond that, uh, meaning uh, lots of growth or restriction uh, on size and space, uh, a lot of churches are going to kind of be uh, in that, you know, in that model. Um, the challenges with that is, is that you end up having restrictions on, on leadership there's only so many, there's only so many spots, uh, in leadership that can be filled, right? Um, you have lead pastors depending on your polity, you have lead pastors and elders, uh, maybe some deacons, but, uh, a pillar church, if a pillar church just grows by getting bigger, um, generally you end up in a place where, uh, there's just no place for, uh, a, a new leader to end up, right? They kind of look up, it's kind of filled. They got to go somewhere else. They got to start a ministry outside of it. So uh, there's lots of strengths, but like that's that's what I found is is probably the biggest drawback of just saying like we're never going to move beyond a pillar church. Colin, anything you want to chip in? Yeah, I mean for me, um, I, I realized that uh, I was Mr. Average. Mr. Average and Mrs. Average tend to be able to build a pillar church to about 68 people. That means it bounces between 50 and 100. And I realized actually I couldn't do more than that. That was actually my, my, my kind of sweet spot, uh, which is very frustrating if you've got a big church dream, which I had. So for me, um, I actually saw the strength of pillar church and thought, Actually, if we multiply this, which is my journey into multi-site, actually, yep. I, I did many of these. Actually, I could do it, and um, so um, yeah. So that's my kind of uh, stake for it. Now, it's very interesting. And so, if we think about moving from down the spectrum, it's interesting what you both have said there in terms of there seems to be. A driver for change is how you talked about it, Brad. So whether that yep. is growth or venue or uh, some, and something we found in in Manchester is the driver for change for us pr probably, and, and maybe for what Colin is saying there was the lack of growth, um, in a funny way, and realizing that multi-site for us was the way that we were going to talk, the way we were going to do mission, and the way that we were going to get some growth moving um is that something you've seen a lot of in multi-site or does it tend to be it has to be your, your buildings filling up or no i think those are those are kind of the two tracks that you end up taking one is that it's a it, you know like we talked about you talked about like you know they kind of evolve into multi-site most multi-sites that that at least in the last 15 years have been practical solutions for practical problems right like um most of it is either driven by we're, we're growing and we're running out of space, or as you're saying, um, we've done what we can do, but, but we feel God's calling us to reach more people. So how can we do that? Um, and so I think those are the two drivers. Either It's either driven by mission or it's driven by uh, that practicality of solving problems. Generally speaking, the mission piece actually probably gets you a more um, designed, designed outcome. Uh, when you're when you're just trying to solve practical problems, that's when you kind of start evolving into something that you may not like ten years down the road. Um, usually, when people are, are motivated by mission, uh, they're actually thinking at, thinking about the future a little bit more. Not always, but a little. That that is very interesting, and I suspect that probably bears out with us. I would have thought. Um, yep. Right, very good. Let's keep it moving. Uh, incidentally, if you're a participant, if you're listening to this, 
if you want to ask a question, please type away in the chat and we'll get to the questions later. There's quite a few of you in there now, which is very good. So we've uh, talked about the Pillar Church and I guess our first step on this multi-site spectrum is to get to the, the Gallery Church, um, which is one church expanded to multiple services, mostly in the same uh, building, but you, you, when you write about it as well, you talk about maybe going into some other venues as well. Um, yeah, so we, what would you say the pros and the cons are for this one? Brad, again, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, I mean, gallery is the natural evolution. Uh, as soon as you kind of can't meet in one space. So as soon as you start going to multiple services, you're already kind of into this gallery model. I thought that was important to identify because um, uh, as soon as you do that, you do end up starting to split your congregation and, and people generally go to the same services. And so you, you can end up having multiple congregations within the same church, right? And so we felt like it needed to have its its own uh, its own label and and uh, an understanding. Um, the positives are is that you don't have to if you when you move in that direction, you don't have to build a bigger building, right? Uh, lots of churches have ended up building beyond their their need. They end up with a big mortgage and a and a big space that they're not filling. And so gallery is a nice way to to move. Uh, into reaching more people, um, service having having more services, but not necessarily having to change your your uh, location or space. And so it's a it's a nice compromise for when you're trying to move in that direction. Um, you know, in terms of in terms of downside of gallery models, um, probably the biggest downside is that they can tend to be consumeristic, right? So, you know, it's like, hey, you can have your contemporary church here and you can have your, you know, cowboy church uh, at 11 and then we do, you know, whatever. Um, uh, it, and, and so it, it can end up kind of fracturing the congregation a little bit internally because you're kind of trying to serve, uh, rather than having conviction and saying, this is who we are, this is who we want to be, you end up trying to, trying to please everybody. And that can be a little bit fracturing. So if there's a downside, I'd probably say that's probably it. It all, it all doesn't. It also doesn't reach a very large area, right? It's still a. It's still a destination. Yep. You've got to come to us, and we've got all these options when you come here. So uh, it, it still has a pretty small footprint in terms of mission reach. It's the kind of shopping mall. Yes, version, which I guess was is probably was probably. The, the kind of mega church thing, particularly in the States. Um, although you do see it a little bit over here. But, uh, Colin, any thoughts on, on that one? No, I mean, I think I agree totally. I don't think, you know, the, uh, it's a, it is a cost-effective way of yeah. maximizing an expensive facility. And yes. I, I've, I've encouraged churches to do that before they go multi-site, you know, in terms of, uh, the, yeah, you can learn how to multiply things, you could learn, you know some basic things that you can get some traction and uh, but uh, it has its downsides so i totally agree yeah and there's a limit to it too um i mean you get you can get to about three services and you're already going to be straining your volunteers and your staff uh but i've seen churches go four or five services and it's just it, it really isn't sustainable i don't think it's sustainable for the soul of a pastor um trying to trying to repeat and preach uh, the same sermon five times like i've just seen it take its toll on preachers um and everyone like this is, they, they go into it thinking oh this won't be a big deal um uh, but um I've, I've seen a lot of churches start to burn out um when they're trying to do that gallery model if they try to get it too big so yeah very good uh, i think in your book it's very interesting where, on each of these where you talk about where the the locus of power, where the, yes. the authority lies. Um, and perhaps the other side of that is like the over impact on that individual or that group as well, as well as their influence. So a pillar and gallery, it, you could probably do it with the same gift, I guess. Um, yeah. the gallery stretches it out to its, to its maximum. Uh, okay, well, let's move on. And the next two, I think, well, actually the next four are pretty interesting, but the, the next two are the last multi-site ones and then after that we're into multi-church um, and I think these two are probably the ones um, we've seen play out most in the UK and that the first one would be a franchise church so 
one church uh, cloned to multiple sites. Um, uh, uh, so, which there seems to be quite a lot of pros and quite a lot of cons on this one. It's pretty interesting. So, uh, what would you say that the column will start with you on this one, on that kind of that franchise model where churches are, are really replicating what they do across multiple locations? What would be the, the benefits of that? What do you think the pros and cons are? Yeah, I mean, it tend, I mean, my take on it is the people who go down this route tend to be platform people to start with. So they've, they've got a big, a big uh, teaching gift, or, uh, and, uh, and so maxim, want to maximise that and see teaching as the kind of uh, unifying uh, the whole thing. But I think the other people I've noticed in are people who've got a very strong organisational administrative gift, um, kind of key gift, that actually they're able to, they, they could see how they can find the same, um, it, it gives um, traction and it actually works towards them. So I could see how it's, uh, how it could, uh, you know, to, some of the positives, but I think the downsides for me, I mean, we've trained a hundred preachers in the last three years. I noticed that if you go down the preaching gift of the next two or three people offer the franchise model, it's very weak uh, relative to the, because um, uh, it just isn't that room. A lot of room for middle management, tons of room for that, not so much room for uh, people to actually really stretch the uh, uh, kind of senior leadership. Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, yeah, I mean, something you, that's in Brad's book is that, that actually this model is not developmental for leaders, particularly, which you hit on straight away, um, just particularly around preaching and teaching and frontline gifts, I suppose. Um, now, Brad, how would you see the, the pros and cons of uh, the franchise church? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the pros of the franchise church is you have something that's working um, and you want to replicate it and do it again, right? So, um, and hopefully by working, that means that the gospel is, is moving forward and people are coming to Christ and, and, uh, and the mission is, uh, is progressing. And so when that's working well, the ability to kind of replicate that um, uh, is, a, is a positive impulse. And the the upside of it is it's really easy it's very quick to replicate right because you don't have to raise up uh, a leader uh, to the you know to a certain level to be able to lead it because um, you're essentially piping the the pulpit in um, and so the ability to to replicate and and start new works is uh, is much faster um, especially if you have a, a uh, someone with a, a a good teaching gift uh, personality, like you can you can just shut up, set up a tent, and people will come, right? Uh, so it's very easy to replicate. Um, uh, the downsides I already talked about. One is that uh, it tends to stunt the growth uh, of uh, of leadership development. Um, what happens in in franchise uh, oftentimes is that the you know usually you have some type of campus pastor. Um, and they can often be pretty green, pretty young, uh, or uh, not a lot of experience, and they can be just happy to be leading a campus of a multi-site franchise. Um, but uh, they, they are going to mature, and they are going to grow, and uh, what I've found with most franchises um, is that unless you're really good at identifying uh, middle managers, <laughs> you know, like people who who that's all they ever want to be. Um, what ends up happening is as these leaders mature, eventually they start getting frustrated because there's nothing that they get to lead. Um, you talked about locus of power. Uh, as you go across the spectrum, uh, you start with kind of uh, powers held centrally. And as you move across, um, it becomes more dispersed. And in a franchise model, you still have a very highly centralized um, power structure. Um, so eventually what happens is you have leaders who are maturing, but they're not making decisions. They're only implementing decisions from someone else. And, uh, and that tends to create frustration. And so, um, 
if you have the right model or if you have the right people in the model uh, and honestly you have the right benevol benevolent leadership, um, you can probably make your franchise last for a while. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about this model is that um, when you have crit critics of multi-site, this is the model they're critiquing most of the time. So this is the caricature of multi-site is the franchise model. And one of the things that we need to at least acknowledge those of us who like multi-site is that they have legitimate critiques. Um, great character will always overcome uh, poor structure. So if you have great character and leadership, you can, you can use any one of these structures. Um, but what I would say is that this structure is probably the most easily abused. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like we have to acknowledge that like this yeah. model, like when someone says, Hey, cult of personality, you know, that's why multi sites, you know, from the devil, uh, as one commentator put it, it's like, well, uh, I don't think that's true, but we do need to acknowledge that like, like this model is the most easily abused because you're able to very quickly, uh, multiply and propagate uh, a platform um, really rapidly and all the power is held uh, very centrally uh, in, in one space. So I think it lends itself to, to more of that um, uh, more of that leadership failure stuff. I think one of the interesting parts of the, the multi-site conversation, even the just the general model of church conversation or even a model of ministry is there's often little acknowledgement of um, the type of person that the individual is that starts it and their particular gifting. So often we're looking to copy a model and we forget that the model was often started by someone who was very particularly wired for that sort of. Uh, and so, and yeah, so in your book, you write about how franchise church can lead to idolizing the church leader. And it might not even be that particular leader's fault. It just, the whole model funnels everybody towards one place most weeks. So Colin, yeah. have you got any particular thoughts on what we said there with franchise? No, I, I mean, I agree. I think obviously the UK perspective is slightly different to the US. In terms of, it's a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, two, three thousand would be probably the top end in the UK. And a lot more would be in their hundreds of congregations of or 5200 um, uh, even on the franchise model so I guess in terms of the personality side of it it's probably not so uh, there but I totally agree that actually yeah it's, um, it, yeah, it's, it's important to know that like like uh, if you have someone who abuses power or someone who's a narcissistic leader they can do that in a pillar church as much as they can do that in a multi-site church. Um, they can do that in any one of these models. There are models that, because of the way that they're organized, that can uh, can help uh, mitigate some of that. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I, sometimes the critique is like, "Hey, you know, multi-site is for narcissists." And I'm like, I've seen plenty of pillar churches led by narcissists. I've seen, I have seen like churches of. 40 led by narcissists. You don't have to be successful to be uh, abusive. So, I've been into particular, particularly ridiculous home groups in my time as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely right. Um, all right. So, let's um, actually the difference between franchise and federation. I think one of the things when, like Colin was saying earlier, with our leaders, um, when, with our new leaders, we often take them through this model uh, without telling them what we are as a church in order to see what they think we are. And I, yeah. I've, I've realized now as we get to kind of um, a federation and cooperative, that's where a lot of us go. And I realized that I like the idea of being closer to the franchise because I work quite a lot in the middle of it. Uh, and more people who weren't, who are site leaders, were more federation and cooperative, which is really interesting. Sure. So let's get into um, federation then, uh, what you guys think the pros and cons of a, a federation church are. Yeah, so the federation model, like some of the marks of the federation model is you move away from the one face. So a federation model generally is marked by the fact that you have live preaching uh, at, at each of your locations uh, and generally has uh, more of a shared leadership or representational leadership. Um, 
federations don't have to have complete um, uh, representation. Like the, the polity can be, you know, maybe a, probably a little bit more um, shared leadership than a, than a franchise. And I've seen, you know, I've kind of seen a spectrum of, of, um, of what that polity looks like. So there's probably, it's, it probably has the most diversity in, in terms of what the polities look like, but generally has live preaching at the local church, um, generally has local elders, uh, each of the congregations. Um, and so the pros of it are you're giving more room for leaders to grow. You're giving more ownership at the local level. Um, and it still has a fair amount of, uh, whatever you want to call it. I'm not a big fan of brand control, but I understand some people, they care a lot about that. Um, and so like, if that's what you're into, like, you know, uh, a federation definitely allows you to do that a little bit more. Um, and so, you know, the, the pros are you're starting to diversify kind of the power structure a little bit. Um, uh, the cons are probably going to be somewhat similar to the franchise models that there's still limitations to, there's still more of a top down feel. Uh, generally these polities are a, 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 a leadership team that's centralized is still making decisions in a federation, uh, like federal government. If you think of like a, a federal government model or, you know, you've got the federal government making decisions, the states are having to implement those decisions. Um, the, that's a little uh, uh, American history lesson. Um, uh, we, we're not all just crazy doing whatever we want, as uh, as I'm sure is the is the rumor. <laughs> um, so that model, there's still a lot of like uh, we have to we have to wait and get approval from uh, you know from the the central leadership. So that's probably you know one of the downsides um, is that it still has some limitations there. But it's a it's it's a to me it's a much more thriving model than uh, than a straight uh, franchise. Yeah, that's right. yeah, very good. So, Colin, um, we are probably federation um, is probably the closest to what Christchurch Manchester is um, with a hint of cooperative and a touch of franchise, I'd imagine. But uh, do you want to tell us how you how why we settled there? What in in our kind of multi-site journey? Yeah, I mean it was partly. Um, history that I started a little bit more as a multi church. Now, I, I mean, that's what I, I didn't call it that, but that's what it was. And uh, I realized the trajectory was in the end that got us to some autonomous churches, which was great. Uh, we were spread out across the city like 30 miles, which right in the UK is a long, is a long way. <laughs> I mean, lived in the States. It seem very far. Yeah. It's, uh, we used to drive that just to church, uh, which I led. Uh, but uh, the uh, I think uh, the uh, for me we were actually into the centre of Manchester more, and uh, that, that actually meant that we could do things a little bit more closer together. And so I think the uh, uh, the federation model I think works for us. I think. The, so the other side is we, we're not going to uh, launch a load of churches before we want to. Um, I think the downside, and we're seeing some of this now, is that the first people we got them, actually, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, the first people who start them, I kind of get the, the thrill of shaping something. And we've now noticed on our fifth and sixth ones, new people come in, in, they have to sit into something that's already formed. And yes. so and, and they don't get that same ability. And, and I think we are working through that now. And I see that, you know, I think 10 years in, that uh, it, it, that's probably a downside, or at least it's a challenge that we have to, um, to, 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 to navigate. Whereas that wasn't the case when we went to the multi-church model where people had much more room to create. Um, so we, I thought it was more creative than it is. And it's only when you realize that it's 10 years in. I still think we'll, we'll stay where we are because I think the upside for what we want where we are, I think is a win for us. But I can genuinely see 
that uh, as you go down a journey, your challenges get different. And what you see as a positive actually it can then be a challenge or even a bit further down the line. Yeah, very good. Um, you, in, the, in your book, right, you talk about um, the, the weakness of this particular is that I guess the weakness is the temptation to lean back to franchise and go for brand over context. Because the big yeah. benefit of uh, franchise is that you, you can do context differently. So we have, for example, we have a, a site in a very, very young professional student in Hartford City, one in the middle class suburbs, one in a very, or two in very poor areas, one right in the, uh, kind of in the urban center of it. So each of those has its own context. Um, and uh, I think our, the temptation, the weakness is that sometimes the center, which isn't involved in the individual context, sees brand over context. So there's always the, the center to the, the edge of the edge, the sites kind of pulling against each other. Um, which, yeah, uh, have you found that to be true generally in, in what you've seen of Federation churches? Yeah, and I think Colin's on to, you know, Colin's on to, like, it, I would use the term ownership, um, is that you know, when you're starting something, you kind of take ownership. This is our, you know, this is our church, and, and um, we have the ability to create and, and to build it. Um, when, you, when you come into something, uh, yeah, you definitely don't, you don't take as much ownership of it, right? And so uh, that can happen, you know, we, we, were, we were in a federation model um, when, uh, when I got to, to Sojourn about seven years ago. It was kind of a federation with some, like similar with, with some uh, franchisee uh, tendencies. And, um, and that was the challenge is that we had urban church and we had suburban church um, and some stuff in between. And it was hard when you're trying to kind of put out a consistent message to be able to actually uh, relate and speak to different contexts. And then people start to lose ownership. And so like ownership is, is a, to me, is a, is a problem for the church because, I mean, it's just a problem in general. People are taking less responsibility for their faith. Um, but, um, but the church is already being marginalized culturally. Uh, and when we marginalize it in our own lives as Christians, uh, we're just feeding into that, that, that cultural trend. And so, you know, anything that you can do to build ownership within your church for, uh, for the congregation, I think is, uh, is important to be thinking through. And, um, you know, uh, in, in my writing in, in, on community group stuff and, and in the multi-church world, I'm definitely a proponent for uh, empowering people at the local level. Um, I don't think other models are wrong, but for me, like I, I'm trying to activate my church and I'm trying to help other churches activate their members um, to really take, uh, take their role in the church uh, seriously and, and, and joyfully. And so that's kind of the, when you talk about losing that ownership, that, that to me is, yeah, we have to watch that. We can find it other ways within that model, uh, but we have to be much more intentional because it's not built into the system. Well, that moves us um, quite nicely onto, so those are the kind of the multi-site um, churches and then there is the multi-church idea and so if we've got we're 10 minutes of talking left. Um, incidentally, if you're listening and you've got questions, feel free, we'll get there in a second. Um, so the cooperative church you describe as one church made up of multiple independent churches. And that sounds about where you're at with Sojourn at the moment. Would that be fair? Yeah, yeah. Sojourn, Sojourn is actually probably a notch over to collective. So we have kind of the cooperative and the collective. Um, these are people should understand that are listening like this is a spectrum yeah. so um, it's not like you can kind of like put a dot in the middle there and say hey this is what uh, a collective church is it's gonna be kind of on a spectrum and uh, the biggest thing when you go into move to the multi-church is uh, is locus of, of power and I would I would argue the easiest way to figure it out is who makes decisions and where does the money go uh, if you're trying to figure out like where are we at? Um, the more money goes to the local church, uh, the more you're moving towards the collective side. Um, and the more decisions are made at the local level, uh, the more you're moving towards a collective. Um, in both of them, uh, 
like the, the, the question that, that people ask is, well, what's the difference between federation and then one of these multi-church cooperatives? And um, that's kind of where I, I, I take them to uh, who make, like who sets the budget? Um, how does money flow? So if money flows into the central bucket and then is dispersed benevolently by the leadership, you're probably in a federation multi-site. Um, if the money stays at the local church and the local church um, um, sends money to the central for services, like a, a certain amount, then you're probably into a multi-church. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to be crass by talking about where the, how the money flows in the church, but that, like, if you're trying to figure out, like, where do these models sit you know for us local churches um they give to the collective the collective provides services uh you know for for those funds um that are equivalent to the services they would have if they just were a pillar church uh, on their own um but but for us this we have uh, elder teams at each local church uh those churches um, make decisions about what they're doing, uh, what their programming is at the local level. Um, but the things that we do in common besides those services are um, we, we preach through the same sermon series. So right now we're in the book of Matthew. All of our churches are in the book of Matthew. Our lead pastors get together um, on a monthly basis to work through uh, what they're preaching so that we're all in sync. So if you go to a sojourn church in Louisville, uh, or uh, or Kentucky or um, Indiana, you're going to be hearing the, roughly the same text, uh, but it's going to be preached contextually by that uh, by that preacher. Um, and so that's kind of the that's kind of the transition. That, like uh, from my perspective uh, as the collective director, there's very little I can dictate. Uh, into any of the local churches, so I have to lead through influence. Um, think of I think it's Collins as uh, level five leadership, right? Like I, I I don't have authority to go in and say, hey, we're not going to do Cheerios anymore. We're going to do Cheez Its uh, in the kids ministry. Um, I don't have I don't have that authority. Um, someone you know I I can say, hey, these taste better, but that's the best I can do. <laughs> so um, Colin, you've kind of actually you, you're probably you're history is more the, the collective end of things, but in terms of cooperative, what have you seen that's worked and um, you think maybe are some of the problems with it? I mean, I think the, the reality is if you want to, there's a church planter, which is effectively where I come from. So I've got a big church in trying to find different venues. I'm a church planter that realized on your own, it's lonely. <laughs> and uh, effectively, if you can have, a number of church planters who actually want to collect together and actually operate. You can actually reach a city better, you can uh, serve each other the gifts. Most church plants and churches are paid to they only have one full timer who tends to be competent in most other areas than what his gift is, but has, is paid so has to do more. And so there was a number of things that I saw as uh, uh, that really helpful. Uh, actually, so I came from it from that perspective, which was kind of autonomous church plants that work together. Um, and uh, so that I thought some, some great strengths in that. So we saw people come through that wouldn't have done without that strength of that. We reached far more people, got into the hundreds, which I never could have done before. Um, I think the the, the downside, uh, and that, this probably reflects me <laughs> as well, is in the end, I used to put it like this, I don't have any soldiers. <laughs> and the soldiers are everybody else. And so we've got nights of prayer, lots of things that actually everybody liked, wanted, but I realised that if I didn't have my own soldiers somewhere, I, I, it was too... Democratic's the wrong word at all. I don't think that it is a democracy, but it, 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 it influences the right word. It was too much network, not quite enough intentionality for me. But that's, I think so. I, it, but the positives is we've got churches that are planted and are doing really well, and we've got leaders coming through. So I, I kind of. Um, a lot of things we do 
still would be more, more bolted church in terms of the, uh, in terms of even the preaching we don't everybody does their own preaching themes their own you know, there was a lot of things i i, I come back to it was more the traction together but i i so that was for me personally that's the that yeah. challenge from what was a lot of upsides as well yeah well, you know tim what some of the challenges that we faced you know, and we still face is like, you know, uh, if you go with more local decisions, uh, you lose control of brand, right? So uh, as we saw, talked about earlier, like if, if, um, if kind of consistency and brand control is really important to you, like, like that's a downsize to either the cooperative or the collective, mm -hmm. um, because you're, you're having more unique expression at the local level. Um, there can be that tension between how much effort do you, I think that's kind of what you were talking about, Colin, like the, the a lot more network <laughs> uh, where there's a lot of, there can be a lot of energy going to try to hold things together. Uh, where as guys get more, uh, more of their own leadership and, and their own growth, they, you know, they have this tendency to kind of go, I don't know if I want to, I don't know if I want to um, sacrifice for the whole, um, which I think is, I think is a, a challenge, but I think it's also a challenge that we should want to face, right? Like we need to, we need to teach our, 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 even our good preachers, like sacrificing for the whole is a Christian value, right? Um, uh, so um, we, there's definitely downsides and challenges to doing the, the collective or the cooperative um, in the sense that it, it tends to move things even farther to the edges. Hmm. Um, there was a there was a, a comment uh, before we started uh, live about uh, I mean one of the things that, about trajectory and there's a some of the models that people talk about is like this you know you kind of come together either as a federation or uh, or a multi church with a trajectory towards autonomy um, and uh, I think that would be an interesting conversation on whether that is actually a good idea. Uh, and, and, what, and you can kind of guess where I would probably land on this, but uh, from a biblical perspective, I don't know that autonomy is the uh, is the pinnacle of church expression, right? Like it's the idea that that pillar church is the is the ideal expression of church. Mm -hmm. um, my argument would be that I can't find a biblical example from the from an individual Christian uh, up, to, you know, to the expression of the church. Where autonomy is um, is considered a positive, right? Right. That like interdependence seems to be the model for the Christian life. Ephesians four. Uh, it seems to be the model for the church in Acts and and, and the early church. Um, and maybe this isn't as much of a drive in Europe as it is here in the states. But we I'm constantly pushed up against this. Like, but but Brad, shouldn't we just want want to start them together and let them you know let them go autonomous uh, but as colin said you know as a church planter it's the loneliest place to be autonomy is is uh is a is a dark place it's a hard place um and so i would just say you know um just to make a point uh, i think I, I believe that interdependence you know on this spectrum is actually a safer uh and a more healthy place uh, for churches to be very good. Um, well, we have in that we've covered, I think, cooperative and collective church probably quite well there, um, uh, which I just think is really interesting. Just tracking the journey through and the comments that have been made. We have a few different questions um, uh, that we will we'll look at now. The, the, the first one I want to go to actually, I think, is, uh, is a, a brilliant question because uh, we've talked a lot about decision making, kind of authority, where the, the locus of power is, that sort of thing. Um, that can be shared in multi-church or multi-site. Um, but uh, the question is about how culture can work in, in that, that context. Um, so does, is there space for, particularly, I guess, in cooperative and collective, for them, the churches, if they have kind of their own leadership teams, to have different cultures? So a good example would be uh, one church uh, is quite happy to let lots of people have a go at preaching and bringing them through quickly. And you don't have to have been in church very long and be particularly well known even and they'll get brought through because that's the the appetite of the leaders that they're whereas other another church in the 
cooperative, you can be much more cautious, conservative about that. You have to be part of the church for a couple of years, etc., etc. So just, um, Colin, to start with, how, how important do you think shared culture is around these models? I think, I mean, I think well, you, uh, you understand Tim, I think culture is massive, and I think how things are done here, um, and I think for me, uh, it's, it's undervalued. Uh, it's kind of, uh, so people want a model, but actually the reality is when people walk through the door of a, of a, of a service, what they get is a culture. Mm. Actually, that's what they, that's what they experience, you know, how people greet them, um, how, how they're treated, um, um, what is the, you know, the level of engagement. Um, and so, uh, for me, I, and having a more consistent culture, I think, is really important. Um, and, uh, and, in fact, for me, it would be, it would be more than having a consistent um, Kind of organisation. You know, having said that, you know I like things uh, reasonably well, uh, reasonably similar. But yeah, so I think uh, have, if you have a, 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 a different culture in different meetings, in the end, uh, that's too, and you've got some spectrum. And if it feels different, then I think in the end, it is the same church. It's 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 it's, it's a different. Mm. That, that's simplistic but it's um... yeah brad what do you think yeah i, I mean I, I certainly agree with what colin says you know like what what people experience is the culture um that uh what i would say is culture is a uh, uh is a manifestation of people in the in the congregation right so um I, there's going to be some things that you try to build into your culture that's you know for us as like these are these are marks of a sojourn church. So we have values that all of our churches ascribe to, but every one of our locations, when you go into, has its own culture that is influenced by those values, uh, but is unique to that place. Um, and so, uh, you know, Colin mentioned spectrum. That you know, for us, uh, our lead pastors, you know, we meet together once a month and we talk about, okay, what are we comfortable with and what are we not? And and so we kind of. It's, it's a moving target in some ways of like, you know, the question of like, like who can preach and who can't. Um, that usually comes up when someone has someone preach that we're like, uh, why did you, why was that person up there, <laughs> you know? And then we say, okay, well, our, our real value is that we want that a little tighter. Or, uh, or maybe someone does something like, that was amazing. Maybe we need to be a little bit looser. Um, and so... I don't know that there's a there's a right or wrong answer, but it's going to be kind of the stomach of your leaders in terms of how uh, how uniform those cultures need to be. They're never going to be completely uniform because they're you know different people in different places. Mm. It's interesting. I think the the place where we've seen most um, uh, most tension, I suppose, is when one leader has a slightly different cultural expectation or cult there's one particular cultural value is more important to them than it is to someone else. So uh, some of our guys are, are obsessed with how welcoming it is on a Sunday morning. Uh, others, it just doesn't occur to them. They're just not naturally good at it. Um, and so that then there's often a tension there when one complains about the other, much more than administratively or budgeting or funding. It's those, those sorts of things which... Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, okay, um, so somebody has asked, uh, how important is it to decide on your model or where you are would like to get to on this kind of uh, church model spectrum? Uh, how important is it to start that before you begin this journey? Or, do, or is it best to just kind of plow in and figure it out as you go along? Colin. <laughs> I think you need, where possible, you need to know and actually, uh, where you want to be um, and I think you know, when I started 20 years ago you just made it up because there really wasn't anything there's enough around now I think to get to give you a bit more of an idea even webinars like this just what you should be going for having said that it's always easier to give than take so for me if you start on a very release model, a very um, 
a model that actually gives a lot more autonomy, uh, uh, local kind of responsibility, uh, you, it, you should never bring that tighter. Because yeah. I think that I've noticed all over the country where people give and then oh, I'm giving far too much. I need to tighten it up. Fundamentally, it's um, really uh, I think it's the worst thing you can do. Because I think it's, um, so I, I I tend to veer personally towards going slightly more to the left if I can use that in terms of not politically, but. Um, you know, so if, if you actually want uh, to be a federation, for instance, like we are, the tendency was to be a bit more franchise to start with, and then actually you can always give more. Whereas if you go down the other route, it's, and you, I think oh, that is what actually I want to. It really is much harder to actually go away. So I think try. I think you need to know where you're going. But a lot of it is kind of on the ground working yeah. it out. Yeah, very good. Uh, Brad, in your, your journey to where to getting to the collective, was that always where you intended to get to? Or, or did it evolve there or yeah, you no, know, it was definitely an evolution, you know, for us. And so I, I agree with, with Colin, it's it's harder to it's harder to give uh, or harder to take back what you've already given. Yeah. Uh, but that's why it's so important to kind of know where you're headed, right? Because that, that cuts both ways, you know? So for us, um, when I got, when I got here, like uh, we were, we were uh, probably in that federation model, but our, our finances were definitely more franchised. So the local church was giving somewhere near 48% uh, of their income was going to the, to the global, you know, sojourn. Um, it's really hard to cut that down, right? So if you don't know where you're going, you can bloat your centralized costs um, to a place where uh, it's really challenging. We went from 48% to 17% um, of a church of, uh, you know, 4,000, 4,500 people. So um, if, if anybody's out there is a math person, uh, <laughs> you can imagine like the pain of trying to make those transitions and cuts. Um, and God was gracious, and we were able to we were able to make that uh, make that happen without um, without too much pain. But um, but it's really hard once you've bloated up a, a central organization uh, to be able to live with something that's pared down. So um, that's why if you like, I think as Colin said, if you if you if you're aiming for a federation have that in mind as you're growing and building your your uh, polity and your and your structures and if you're going for a multi-church have that in mind so don't so don't over inflate your central uh leadership stuff um and, and part of this for, for me like uh i i'm actually uh professionally trained as an engineer so um, i have 10 years as an engineer so for me i'm like how could you build a church if you don't know where you're going? Like, you gotta know kind of where uh, where the end game is. Um, but that's why we wrote the book too. I mean, we both wrote the book to help people get a better idea of what they're going after, so that they don't have to do the evolutionary pain that guys like Colin and myself have had to go through mm. uh, to try to get to where we wanted to be. Mm. Very good. I think the other thing too uh, is churches. I've been talking to one or two just recently. We want to go multi-site, but their staffing is all uh, kind of pillar, for, and that is very difficult because when we started, we made sure that everybody was part-time, including myself, and that actually, in a sense, helped us on the central costs. But sometimes we'll have central costs, which is more to do with the fact that a person or a couple or two people are actually consuming all the products anyway in terms of their costs but then they go two sites but they're only in one of them and so i think there's some challenges that a lot of people don't think about so they end up with a high centralized budget which is by default not by design and, uh, yep. so sometimes some quite radical adjustments have to be made actually to get to a, a, 
not a franchise model, but a federation or a multi-church. Um, and that's why, again, it, like, thinking these through is really important. Uh, I, I'm not a chess player, but I understand a little bit. For chess players, you, you need to think three steps ahead of the game. I think too few people, especially the multi-site one, actually think like three steps down the line. You know, if we do this, what's, what's actually going to affect in five years' time? How's that going to affect where money flows and who's employed and do we believe in part time or not part time? Our salary, even the salary scale is different. Yeah. So, a person who's running the church of 200 and the church of the church of 70, just in our context, it's just a different, just the whole expertise and uh, where money is. So, I think it really is important to be thinking where are we going with this? What's, what are we actually building? And what actually are the sacrifices and the adjustments that will need to take place down the road? And at least have an awareness of that. Well, that's uh, very, and you both kind of said that. So let's just finish with a, one last question here. Um, for Let's imagine that people who are listening to this uh, are either about to go multi-site and they may be the number one leader who leads the whole thing, or you may be about to become the first site leader um, of this. What are the what are the things that you need to what, what are the things you need to think down the line about? What kind of your your top two or three things you think? Okay, you guys need to have thought through this, otherwise it's going to go south quite quickly. Um, Brad, I'll, I'll put that to you first. If that makes sense. Uh, sure. Uh, if, if you're just going multi-site, uh, the first thing you got to know is that your first one and your probably your second one is not where you're going to feel pain. <laughs> it's, it's the third one that you have to change, that you change, generally have to change your quality, your leadership structure, and, and your financial structures and stuff. So, uh, so the thing that I would be saying is like, if you're going multi-site, think about what are you going to do when you're at, at four locations? And what do you want to be when you're at four locations? Because that first one, you know, the leaders, I'm just happy to be part of this thing. And like, and we work together, we're just hanging out. We, you know, we, we solve all our problems together. When you get to four, you start having like lots of voices in that room. And so um, how is money gonna, uh, how is money gonna flow? Uh, how are decisions gonna be made? How are people gonna be taken, who's responsible for people? Uh, how are they gonna be taken care of? So those are the things that um, I would want to be asking if I was like, God's leading us into a multi-site solution. Um, let's think ahead at, at kind of that level four. Mm. Yeah. Very good. Colin, what about you? Yeah, I totally agree with what Brad said. I think uh, we sometimes talk about the rip effect, but that is, again, when you do it three or four times, the relationship rip is really high because uh, you know everyone that's lost a, a friend that goes to lost a friend go to another site. Their children have friends that go. So I feel like understanding how are you going to start the next? How many people are going to be taken out of? And is it actually um, feasible? You know. Can, so it is, once you get to the fourth, fifth one, the, the rip effect I think is high, and uh, you, you need to have figured out how that, how that emotionally is uh, affecting the church and making it a storm. Um, so I would add that into the equation. And I think the other one is actually raising leaders up on the fourth, fifth, and sixth is much harder than the first, second, and third, where you tend to have almost a reservoir of leaders who are ready to go and you think ah we've got a leadership development track and normally you've actually got them just there waiting and actually the next one it's a completely different uh, gig to actually uh, trade up and raise the leaders very good that's very good that's very helpful well gentlemen thank you very much we have uh, covered all sorts in this in terms of different models of multi-site 
Uh, I hope it's been helpful for the people who have been listening, just even think about where they are at at the moment, where they would like to be, and what looks, you know, what sits well with you. For some people, um, kind of just personality-wise and their team, collective and cooperative are going to be much more natural than uh, franchise and federation. But and there's a lot to think through there in how we do those things well. Uh, so if you want more, we're going to do a whole bunch more of these uh, kind of broadcasts over the next year or so. All the information will be on uh, the broadcast network and .org, our website. So please uh, go and have a look there or email us.